NVIDIA, as it often does, has selected one name to identify multiple types of products in its stack. And that name today is Reflex. So this new NVIDIA Reflex suite is a collection of features that NVIDIA has pushed out in some ways in multiple public driver releases and in other ways through monitor releases that are coming out now. So it gets a little bit confusing. We're going to break it all down today. We have some testing of NVIDIA's Reflex in the form of its Reflex Latency Analyzer in the form of Reflex Ultra Low Latency Mode. We'll be testing the older NVIDIA control panel options that have long been in arcane lore about how to improve your gaming uh, responsiveness and a couple of other things. And we're comparing that with the help of the LDAT as well, which is an external tool that's used for measuring uh, total system latency. So that'll be what we're looking at. We have a 360 hertz display being used for this as well. It's a new one. It's a Dell display, and it has the new integrated features for latency analysis. So we'll be looking at those briefly as well. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Corsair Dark Core RGB Pro wireless mouse, which claims sub one millisecond wireless response, low latency Bluetooth, an 18,000 DPI sensor, a 2000 Hertz pulling rate, and interchangeable side grips. Corsair's mouse can charge on the MM1000 mouse pad with Qi charging, or it can be used wired. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first of all, NVIDIA basically begged us to include GeForce experience in this analysis. We'll be doing so, but probably not, uh, not in a way that NVIDIA will ultimately be... They, they'll probably not be happy with asking for it to be included in the way that they did, uh, because our opinions of it are probably quite different from what they want. But we'll be talking about that separately. Uh, first of all, Reflex Low Latency Mode is part of the NVIDIA Reflex SDK. This was all announced alongside the RTX 3000 series cards, and we've finally gotten time and tools to test them. So NVIDIA sent over the new 360 hertz display to be included in this testing. It's some kind of Alienware display. Frankly, it doesn't matter a whole lot. All that really matters is that the uh, reflex features on the physical hardware side are included, and that's part of what we'll be looking at. Uh, so game by game, some of these reflex low latency mode features can be included. This is not a driver level feature. That means it's not a universal feature that is uh, workable on all, all games. It does have to be implemented by the developers game by game, and that's probably the, the key takeaway to start with. NVIDIA's control panel, on the other hand, uh, does have an existing mode called NVIDIA Ultra Low Latency, and this mode, or this setting, will work on all NVIDIA cards at least 900 series and sooner. So uh, this has nothing to do with RTX in this instance. It does not require new hardware. Uh, it does not require a special monitor, and it's been around for quite a while now. In fact, it might be most beneficial to systems with older GPUs as well. That's something we'll be talking about in our benchmarks. So we'll discuss what that does more in detail later on, but uh, it's intended to reduce the render latency in GPU bottleneck scenarios. NVIDIA Reflex Low Latency Mode gets some discussion first. So this is a feature that can be enabled in the settings menus of supported games. So Call of Duty, Modern Warfare, or Warzone, for example, Valorant and Fortnite uh, also are in the leading pack. Other games include Apex Legends, Destiny 2, and Mordhau, which have also announced that they will implement Reflex. And some may have done so by the time this video goes up, but most were still working on it. NVIDIA Reflex Performance Overlay is also included here. This is a feature included with GeForce Experience, not the standalone NVIDIA driver. It maintains a live counter of FPS, render present latency, and render latency. With a compatible monitor, which we'll cover next, it can also show PC and display latency per click. And with a compatible mouse, it can show mouse latency and total system latency per click as well. It also shows a running average of the last 20 measurements for those last three items. The overlay is theoretically not exclusive to RTX GPUs, but neither the new performance panel in GFE nor the performance overlay were visible on the system we used to write this script which has a 1070 Ti. All this stuff is still in beta though, so there's time for it to come out for more things. As of now, the performance overlay can't output a log file, and the Dell AW2521H 360Hz monitor that we were sent for testing is capable of displaying PC plus display latency via its own OSD or on-screen display. So the main advantage of NVIDIA's performance overlay is that it can show mouse latency and therefore total system latency as long as the right monitor and the right mouse are used. As for LDAT, which is the latency analyzer tool that we validated previously against a high-speed camera, they produce basically the same result. It's just LDAT significantly easier, technically a bit more accurate as well. But LDAT 
is only capable of reporting what we call TSL or total system latency and that's as a whole. So the GFE overlay has an interesting benefit potentially here in that it would allow a user to break down the latency into individual time uh, segments that are unaffected by variance from other links in the chain. How actionable this is maybe depends on what type of scenario you're looking at, whether you're bound by a component like a GPU or a CPU or some other issue is at play. So it, you get into territory where this is probably something that, like a lot of technologies that we cover, a lot of users will feel like they're getting value out of, but not, might not actually be getting value out of. And the people who really need it will get value out of it. And those might be the ultra competitive players who are trying to narrow down, okay, what, what is it? Something is screwing me over. I can't figure it out. What is it? That might be where the benefit arises. In the future, NVIDIA claims that part of the performance panel will include the ability to do basic GPU overclocking. This is, of course, all functional through existing tools as well. Uh, it will offer automatic or manual overclocking options. Apparently, we may test them at some point. It's tangentially related to reflex in the sense that higher GPU performance should, in a sense, improve latency. Now, NVIDIA really, really wanted us to talk about GeForce experience in this piece. In fact, they uh, kept explicitly asking us to include discussion of GeForce experience in the piece. Companies typically stay away from editorial requests like that because normally if, if we're not going to talk about something, there's a good reason for it or uh, we want to look into it more, one of the two. We know it's there. We'll get to it if we care about it. And uh, we might not get to it if we have other things that are better to do. Uh, but because NVIDIA was so desperate for us to talk about GFE, we'll happily uh, satisfy this request. So NVIDIA ruined GeForce experience a couple of years ago for a few different reasons. One of them was it added a mandated login and user account and password to use the service when previously, if I recall correctly, it was GFE 2.0 or maybe just before 2.0, previously you could just launch it and do stuff with it, like an actually good application for a product uh, that you may have paid hundreds of dollars for. If you paid $1,000 for a GPU or $700 or whatever the case may be, to then go and ask the user to provide you with additional data or an account so that you can attach data to that account or uh, a means for you to collect telemetry information, to, to ask for all of that after they've already given you money is not cool to us. That It's a tremendous waste of time and it's a waste of actually some pretty good software. GFE has good stuff bundled into it. But NVIDIA, if you've already sold me the damn card, I've given you all that I need to give you. I shouldn't need to then give you a username and a password to use something like Shadowplay, which at th this point is readily provided by other services as well. So it's just, it's a shame that NVIDIA has bundled in this requirement of username and password for GFE. We hope that one day it will wake up and realize that this should be provided as a free service without needing additional steps. I'm sure NVIDIA will look at this and go, but it is a free service. Yes, but this is a difference where if you're talking about something like a physical product that was sold for a lot of money, by the way, uh, versus a free software solution online that you can download. Like if, if GeForce Experience were a third-party app made by someone else, some other company, they technically didn't charge you for it. We've all been conditioned to expect that there's a trade of information here. You're getting something for it because it's clearly not money. So what is it? It's my account information and whatever else is attached to it. And we're not even that mad about the telemetry stuff. It's the fact that this used to be extremely accessible and easy to launch and easy to use everything in it. And now you need another damn username and password and another stupid program running in the background, pinning servers, calling home and causing issues. So that is our coverage of GeForce Experience for this piece. And now hopefully we can get back to covering the things that are actually interesting, like the physical hardware and uh, some of the changes that were made. The next component of this piece is NVIDIA's Reflex Latency Analyzer. This is a built-in feature of select G-Sync monitors, which performs exactly the same function as the LDAT one, which we covered previously. As a reminder, LDAT is a reviewer tool that straps onto a monitor and helps to monitor response times. One of our concerns with LDAT was that someone could easily incorrectly use it to create bad data. The tool is that good. It's good enough that you can produce bad data, which is what anyone who's really into testing wants, 
but that also means that it could be potentially dangerous if released to the general public without a, a very detailed usage guide. Overall, we found it to be faster and within similar accuracy, actually a bit better than a high-speed camera. So these are all good things for LDAT. Reflex Latency Analyzer doesn't really have anything to do with NVIDIA Reflex other than being a convenient tool for testing it. So we'll call it RLA or Latency Analyzer to avoid confusion. RLA works with non-reflex games or even things that aren't games, exactly as LDAT would. The main difference from the LDAT is that with RLA, instead of using an external luminance sensor, the G-Sync processor simply examines the brightness of a user-specified area of the screen and software. According to NVIDIA, quote, effectively, the G-Sync module knows the luminance values of each pixel within the frame buffer as they are being scanned out, end quote. Since the LDAT attempts to measure latency against the first possible instant that change is detected on the screen, again, see our previous coverage, this should come out to almost exactly the same thing, despite the difference in testing method. The main difference between this, the publicly available RLA or latency analyzer tool that you will be able to get through monitors, and the reviewer-only LDAT solution is pretty easy to point out. One, uh, LDAT inherently measures total system latency, again, TSL as we call it, from mouse to the screen. And uh, RLA can only measure total system latency when certain mice are plugged into certain USB ports on certain monitors. So that's the driving difference between them. Otherwise, RLA just measures PC and display latencies overall. Uh, RLA is a hardware feature. It exists within the G-Sync modules on certain new displays like the uh, Dell 360 Hertz display that we're working with today. And existing G-Sync modules and existing displays will not have the option of being updated to include this feature in them. So if you already have a G-Sync display and it's not on the list, then it will not be on the list is our current understanding of this anyway. So when we refer to G-Sync going forward, what we're really going to be talking about is the physical NVIDIA hardware modules that are installed inside of G-Sync monitors. As far as G-Sync, the feature, the toggle in NVIDIA's control panel, uh, we are not talking about the adaptive sync option, and we're not talking about G-Sync compatible adaptive sync options that you can toggle in control panel. We test without adaptive sync, and you actually don't need adaptive sync to be enabled for RLA to work. Uh, we disable it again for all testing for consistency. G-Sync compatible FreeSync monitors, for example, will not have this feature either. Finally, NVIDIA launched its NVIDIA RLA compatible mice. As of this writing, four mice are compatible with RLA and only three of them with publicly available firmware. This list, unfortunately, does not include the Logitech G203 that's currently wired up for our LDAT testing. When these mice are plugged into a specific port on RLA-equipped monitors, they report their own latency per click, which can be added in to calculate the total system latency. The port on the monitor acts as a pass-through and shouldn't add any latency to the total. We're somewhat leery to trust mice to report their own numbers, but NVIDIA has informed us that it'll continue to individually validate mice for compatibility. For some unvalidated mice, NVIDIA maintains a database of average latencies. For example, our Logitech G203 should have an average per click latency of 3.2 milliseconds according to that database. This is the least convenient part of using RLA, but also the least useful element of RLA for customers. Mouse latency is relatively constant, so getting click latencies on a per click basis isn't that much more useful than looking up the average number in the database by NVIDIA or in a review if you can find it. The test resolution for mouse latency and all other latencies reported by RLA is 100 microseconds, just like with LDAT. Whether that's because of the polling interval or simply because the overlay only displays numbers in milliseconds to one decimal place, that's what the, the outcome is. In our reviewer's guide, the Razer Death Adder V2 Pro is the only mouse currently marked as wirelessly compatible with RLA. The LDAT can theoretically work with any wireless mouse, but it can't isolate mouse latency. This gets really interesting too, because now you're in territory where it, it almost feels a little bit dangerous for NVIDIA to be playing this game, where it's providing some information that's potentially extremely interesting to the player, if not potentially actionable and useful, depending on who you are. But at the same time, it's providing data which could be used potentially to uh, maybe invalidate or call question to certain marketing numbers by mouse manufacturers. So how many mice vendors dive into this, we're not really sure, but 
either way, the end result is probably going to be some discussion online of people calling to question some of the numbers associated with mice versus what they're seeing in testing. If, if uh, any public testing can be done on certain mice outside of just media alone, obviously the internet will jump all over it because latency is this huge, really highly debated topic online. And so anything in, in the latency bucket will be fiercely debated and challenged as soon as people have the tools to do so. So first up, we're gonna do testing versus LDAT. We first want to validate NVIDIA's reflex latency analyzer versus the reviewer LDAT solution, the external tool. And as a reminder, again, we previously validated LDAT versus a high-speed camera. It came out good, everything's accurate, and we trust that its data is accurate as long as the technician knows what they're doing. We've figured it out at this point, but if you happen to build something similar, you would need to take care to understand how the games behave when you're testing them. The Logitech G203 that we've tested previously with LDAT is not technically compatible with NVIDIA RLA. We did end up modifying some mice to get cross compatibility, but NVIDIA sent us two mice that are uh, out of box compatible with RLA. So we took apart the Steel Series Rival 3, we modified it, and we made it work with LDAT by soldering in a, a resistor and some wires to make it cross compatible. That way we can validate one against the other. Pretty easy stuff to do, uh, but it allows us a more direct comparison to make sure the numbers being produced by NVIDIA software are accurate to reality. First though, we ran through some tests with the G203 comparing RLA's PC and display numbers to the LDAT's PC and display and mouse numbers. We knew that the G203 would have an average latency of 3.2 milliseconds according to NVIDIA. So by adding that to the RLA's reported numbers, we could get a rough picture of its accuracy compared to the LDAT. We won't dig too deep into those numbers since it was a quick validation test, but RLA's numbers are extremely close to the LDAT's and approximately 0.2 milliseconds lower on average. Note that hardware accelerated GPU scheduling was disabled for all these tests in this piece, just in case you're curious about that. Modding the Rival 3 allowed us to get more accurate numbers per click without relying on NVIDIA's mouse latency database, which is an NVIDIA first party solution. We used the simple flashing speed of light utility for testing LDAT to get these numbers, but they were validated in games as well. On average, RLA reported a time of uh, 373 microseconds less than the LDAT. We don't consider this a big deal because the deviation is both small and consistent and predictable. Even when tested in games with latencies greater than 100 milliseconds, RLA still just reported 300 to 400 microseconds less than LDAT. And remember too that there are some changes methodologically here. So with LDAT, it only triggers once it has detected a real world physical change in pixels uh, to the tune of about 6% change in brightness. RLA triggers practically instantly, and that's based on what's in the frame buffer because it's got some additional insight that an external tool doesn't have. So there's advantages to each. An external tool is always the most trustworthy because you're not dealing with any kind of software for the most part. Uh, whereas an internal tool might have access to deeper information that could prove potentially useful or more accurate depending on how it's executing. There are three luminance sensitivity settings for RLA, but we found that changing this setting had no difference for reported latency. The real world testing, you see pixels take obviously time to brighten, whereas in a frame buffer, it's basically instant. It's, it's either bright or it's not bright. Additionally, as far as the discrepancy between the data, the SteelSeries Rival 3 hasn't officially been tested by NVIDIA for LDAT, as far as we're aware. So there's a possibility that there's some unexpected behavior there. That would definitely be suboptimal for other reasons because it would make it hard to leverage LDAT for testing mice head to head, for example, but uh, this is the least of our concerns. We think it's the least likely. It's just another factor that could be uh, up for consideration. The main difference we think is seeing into the frame buffer versus seeing physically the change in brightness. So either way, our conclusion here so far, regardless of the delta, is that RLA is accurate within reason. So that's all we have to say about the RLA part of this tool. We need to look at reflex low latency mode as well. That's probably the most interesting aspect of all this. The idea of latency analysis though through RLA is cool. It is interesting, but we also covered that heavily in our previous LDAT piece where we talk about latency testing methodology. RLA is less useful to people like us who are doing this as uh, a job to test one component versus another, one game setting versus another or whatever, because we're almost universally using an external tool to eliminate as many variables as possible and to fully control the environment. And one of the things that we wanna control is what monitor we're using, what resolution we're using, stuff like that. 
Whereas this, currently, uh, RLA, it's, it's built into the monitor. It can't be moved around at will. It can't be applied to other types of tests, but it's a cool feature potentially for competitive gamers who want to tune graphic settings uh, for the best possible response times. So that's maybe one of the more interesting aspects. If you think it's a fun idea to spend uh, your Saturday afternoon or something going through a few game settings and getting an instant response without a whole lot of setup like we have to do, then you can do that with this tool. So that's potentially very interesting. Uh, potentially very interesting for gaming focused as in video games, content creators who uh, are into the competitive scene and might want to put out data on uh, setting X versus setting Y, producing a, a different response or uh, behavior in latency. Uh, that said, if you're one of those people, be careful while doing it to, to do lots of validation testing because you can always screw the data with this type of stuff. So be careful of that. But that's mostly where it's interesting. The fact that this is only a feature on high-end 360 hertz monitors does limit its usefulness. Latency is also almost... Uh, always going to be very damn low at 360 hertz, and uh, especially if you're running the frame rates that high. But the kind of person who buys a 360 hertz monitor obviously cares deeply about their latency and will at least convince themselves that they're able to make good use of this feature. We'd recommend, though, mentally separating RLA from the next talking point, which is reflex low latency mode. Because with these things, RLA doesn't conceptually map to uh, reflex low latency mode, and you'll see why in a moment. So reflex low latency mode is the most relevant part of this whole reflex package for a general audience. It should be usable by anyone with a 900 series card or newer, in supported games anyway, and supported games have a menu option labeled NVIDIA Reflex or similar with the options of off, on, or on with boost. Reflex low latency mode is analogous to the NVIDIA Ultra low latency mode, the option that's in the NVIDIA control panel, but with much finer control. NVIDIA has defined the low latency settings in the control panel to be as follows. Off, the game's engine will automatically queue one to three frames for maximum render throughput. On, it limits the number of queued frames to one. This is the same setting as max pre-rendered frames equals one from prior drivers. Or ultra, or null. It submits the frame just in time for the GPU to pick it up and start rendering. Meanwhile, NVIDIA describes reflex low latency mode like this, quote, when developers integrate the Reflex SDK, they are able to effectively delay the sampling of input and game simulation by dynamically adjusting the submission timing of rendering work to the GPU so that they are processed just in time." End quote there. We highly recommend reading through NVIDIA's Reflex blog post if you're curious about more. It goes into more details about the mechanics of latency than we really have airtime for here. The key difference is that Null leaves the CPU and the game engine spinning their wheels even as the GPU's render queue is reduced, while Reflex allows the game itself to somewhat intelligently choose when to submit the work. This also has the benefit of allowing the CPU to wait around for user inputs for as long as possible and then submit everything to the GPU just in time to be rendered making the gap between input and output as small as possible given the frame rate. Now, an important takeaway here is that these latency reduction methods are really only useful or are mostly useful where you have a jammed pipeline for the GPU. So if you're in a GPU bottleneck scenario, it'll be helpful. And if not, then you probably won't see very much change. This is what we meant earlier when we said that RLA and reflex low latency mode don't gel conceptually. RLA is for latency obsessed, competitive gamers who are playing Twitch shooters with high-end equipment and who will tune their graphic settings way down to get any kind of advantage whatsoever. That's who that is for, mostly. Uh, and it's currently only available, again, on 1080p 360Hz monitors, so it's very limited. Meanwhile, Reflex Low Latency Mode is available mostly universally, and uh, it's also mostly useful at low frame rates. It's kind of the opposite end of things, in a, in a sense. Uh, high graphic settings, high resolutions, or older GPUs would be scenarios where you get the most value out of this one. That just leaves boost. Low latency boost is an in-game feature that does basically the same thing as setting power management mode to prefer maximum performance in the NVIDIA control panel. It forces the GPU to maintain boost clocks even when it's lightly loaded, so CPU bottleneck scenarios. This isn't a new feature, and it seems to be bundled with Reflex, mostly so that Reflex's menu option can still give some small latency improvement, even if there's no GPU bottleneck. The only downside is increased power consumption, so for all of our Reflex testing, we used on and boost. 
For hardware, we used one of our existing GPU task benches with an RTX 3080 and the same RLA-equipped 360Hz monitor. Despite having access to RLA, we used the external LDAT with the original Logitech G203 for all of the game tests. We did this for two reasons. One, we've done a huge amount of validation on the LDAT and trust it when compared to, say, a high-speed camera. And two, RLA hasn't yet added logging to it. Instead, it displays a rolling average of the last 20 clicks, which is not really that useful, ultimately, if you're trying to produce any kind of meaningful amount of data. We'll start off with Call of Duty Modern Warfare from 2019, a title where NVIDIA has done a little bit of double dipping to try and fill out its roster of reflex-equipped games. Modern Warfare and Warzone are kind of sort of the same thing, certainly in terms of graphical features, but we opted to test Warzone using the small-scale training match with bots as our benchmark. Call of Duty is an RTX-enabled game, so max settings does include an RTX option. Right away, it's obvious that Reflex provided us no benefit whatsoever with our original maxed-out settings. Average latency without Reflex was 34.25 milliseconds, and average latency with Reflex was 34.29 milliseconds, well within variance and error. However, maxing out the resolution scaling option did show some benefit. That's 200% versus the monitor's native 1920x1080 resolution, so it does increase the GPU load. With the increased load, there was a measurable difference, down from 54.1 milliseconds without reflex to 51.4 milliseconds with reflex and boost. That's not a massive improvement, but a quick check of the FPS in our test area shows that it's essentially free. We only did one pass to measure FPS for this one because it's not really the goal of this content, and the only point of even checking at all was just to make sure there wasn't some hidden cost to the latency changes. Still, this is enough to show that there isn't some huge performance drop-off or massive change when using Reflex. The changes you see might level out with more test passes, but we just wanted to verify that quickly, and it was verified. There's no major performance shift in terms of FPS. Fortnite has recently added RTX support, which gives us a great way of overloading even the 3080 and creating a GPU bottleneck at 1080p. Thanks, Epic. To be fair, they've also added DLSS, but we won't be using that for these tests. NVIDIA has apparently worked closely with Epic for the Reflex rollout, since they've also added an option to show a flashing square on the screen with each click of the mouse. This eliminates the need to use something like Muzzle Flash to test latency, which has a huge amount of extra technician error added in if you, as a tester, are not really aware of how to properly test it and at what point in the animation cycle that flash shows up. As NVIDIA is eager to point out, this allows testing during actual gameplay, not just tightly controlled areas with easily visible muzzle flash. In spite of this, we want to produce data which is comparable to anything, so we stuck to our usual testing location using the Battle Lab for consistency. If you are just working with one system with one set of components, it's maybe worth playing around in a real match. But if you're trying to compare multiple things and settings like we are, you do need to eliminate that extra variable of an online match. At max settings, including RTX, the average system latency was a sluggish 1 or 3.7 milliseconds, which, again, is basically sandbagged by RTX's requirements. We experimented with NVIDIA's ultra-low latency mode first, combining it with the preferred maximum performance power setting, which did give us a small reduction in average latency down to 101 milliseconds. But that's barely anything compared to the reduction with Reflex. Reflex brought average latency down to 52.7 milliseconds, a massive 49% reduction over the original number. That's not the whole story, though. We also tried disabling RTX while leaving all the other settings maxed out, which netted a much greater improvement in latency down to 20.3 milliseconds average. Keep in mind that this is no longer like for like, as we've removed the GPU bottleneck. There was no remaining advantage to be found with Reflex, which averaged 20.5 milliseconds here. This goes back to our earlier point. Competitive gamers who really care about low latency will benefit far more from sacrificing graphics fidelity to max out their frame rate. Still, Reflex really does work in GPU-bound scenarios. Now for some quick FPS numbers. Again, these are roughly taken. It's not tested in our usual uh, strict ways. We measured 244.6 FPS average versus 240.7, which is well within test variance in this instance. We're showing these numbers again to illustrate the fact that when we saw that huge benefit from Reflex, the game was running well below 60 FPS and thus was GPU bound, which all makes sense conceptually. Valorant is a game that we haven't tested before and we hope to never have to test again because we don't want their garbage anti-cheat invasive solution that's constantly running 
uh, to ever be on any of our systems. We made sure to manually stop Valorant's anti-cheat feature, which always runs and always has to exist, before running any other game tests. This chart is good news for Valorant in that nothing we did at 1080p could raise latency beyond 16 milliseconds average. It's clearly a game where reaction time is vital and has been tuned, or at least tuned for, by the game's developers. The game's stylized art and limited graphics options are geared towards higher frame rates already, rather than photorealism. Enabling reflex and boost had no significant impact on latency, while enabling null and max performance very slightly raised the average latency, although less than one millisecond of difference is both negligible and questionable in terms of how reliable that really is as being a meaningful change. Despite the already extremely low total system latency, lowering graphics settings to the minimum possible values, but still at 1080p, had approximately the same effect in the opposite direction. Latency was improved to 14.9 milliseconds or 15 with reflex enabled, so the same. As Nvidia has said, frame rate and system latency don't technically have a one-to-one -one relationship, but boosting frame rate is still one of the easiest and most effective ways to lower latency in most instances, but not all. Taking a look at the rough FPS averages confirms the source of the latency improvement. Valorant is a game that will run at extremely high frame rate without complaint, and anyone who is seriously desiring to lower latency for competitive reasons should look towards that solution of increasing frame rate first. This product is somewhat tricky to deliver a verdict on because it's got a lot of disparate elements. So let's break those down into the pieces one more time for what each aspect of Reflex is. Reflex low latency mode is cool. It's interesting, we'll come back to this in a moment. Reflex performance overlay, whatever. Uh, <laughs> they were insistent that this was important, and that it was half the story, but we strongly disagree with that. It's much less than half the story. NVIDIA Reflex Latency Analyzer makes sense to be rolled out with really expensive displays, and we'll come back to this point as well. And then NVIDIA RLA compatible mice would be the final point of all of this, and that's kind of the bottom of the reflex totem pole as far as we're concerned. So let's loop back. NVIDIA Reflex low latency mode. This is the one that we think is actually pretty cool. Uh, despite the fact that it's only in a small number of games, and despite the fact that it's not especially useful to competitive gamers in the same way that RLA could potentially be, uh, it is still interesting. It's toggling an option that's essentially free in terms of frame rate in order to reduce the uh, response that you're seeing. This is especially useful when it's used without boost. Remember that enabling boost as well will increase power consumption. It'd be nice to see more games implement this, even if it is a little ominous to see graphics menus getting stacked full of NVIDIA exclusive features. And that gets into another discussion entirely of uh, access to features between multiple vendors where as more games implement things like Reflex or RTX or whatever, AMD is going to be forced to have a response. AMD has its own uh, latency features that we hope to look into soon. We're probably going to wait for RDNA 2 though just because, uh, well, it's not that far away and it'll be the most relevant to look at. So we do plan to come back and visit some of the anti-lag features when RDNA 2 uh, is in our hands. NVIDIA Reflex Performance Overlay. This is the one that's, uh, maybe it's kind of okay. As we mentioned earlier, most of the numbers it reports, uh, other than mouse latency and therefore total system latency, are visible either via the monitor's on-screen display or via the game interface and menu. So NVIDIA says, quote, any game that integrates the NVIDIA Reflex SDK also has the ability to add both game latency and render latency metrics to their game stats. So depending on the monitor in the game, that's kind of what we're looking at. Given how few people will ever own a compatible monitor and mouse, we suspect this feature will remain buried and is the most likely to get silently killed or stop being supported in the list of other old technologies that NVIDIA has made that stop getting supported uh, somewhat silently. As for NVIDIA Reflex Latency Analyzer, for the average person, this tool is useful exactly once per game. Uh, you check the latency, you think, huh, neat, and then you probably never use it again. So the target users for this feature are, again, people who will repeatedly check in and fine tune things because they are obsessing over this one metric, which we're not saying that's a bad thing. We certainly obsess over metrics here at Gamers Nexus. That's sort of what we do. So if you're in that camp and you find it fun 
to tune for latency, then cool, this is useful to you. But if you're hearing this and you're going, I still suck at games and this won't help me, then it's not gonna matter. So it's an interesting tool and it's useful in precisely the context that it's being sold, which we think is completely fair. As long as it's being marketed accurately, then it's all fine. For internal testing, we'll continue to use the LDAT just because of its versatility. But if we didn't have a choice, this would be a good option as an alternative. Obviously, the LDAT is not a competing product because you can't buy one, at least not right now. And so that makes RLA potentially interesting if you want to work with one fixed monitor and produce similar data. Finally, as for the NVIDIA RLA compatible mice, again, we view this as the lowest run in the poll. We were able to directly measure mouse latency with the Logitech G Pro and SteelSeries Rival 3 and infer latency for the Logitech G203. And all three of them had small, consistent latencies around three milliseconds. Finding a compatible mouse, plugging it into the right USB port on the monitor, and getting the software working isn't worth the time it takes to set up, especially because there's not really anything you can actually do to change that number. Uh, all it does is, if, if you're unhappy with the number for some reason, all it does is tell you to buy a different mouse. And most of them won't work with it. So now you're looking at numbers that you're producing versus numbers that mouse manufacturers produce, and un unless they're both supported for RLA, then it's, you're kind of comparing two different sets of data. And it's not particularly actionable. So again, this is another one where it's like, uh, okay, neat, but not super useful. So to quickly recap, uh, some of this is extremely interesting, like low latency mode. I keep looking at the sheet because damn it, NVIDIA, all the names are, they all have reflex in it. And it's, it's hard to keep up sometimes. But low latency mode is probably the most interesting. We did see a massive shift in latency in some of the scenarios that we tested and a less massive shift in others. But in instances where it produces a uh, significant improvement, well, it's not a bad idea to just toggle the setting on if you're competitive. Maybe you'll actually feel a difference when you're talking about a 40, 50 millisecond change like we saw in one of those titles. But for the rest, eh, it's interesting. And we think it's cool, but that doesn't mean that it's a widely interesting product for the rest of them. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. You can go to store.cameraxis.net to help us out directly. Uh, we have our tools available on back order there if you want one of the toolkits or the mod mats. And the mouse mats are arriving back in stock soon. Or you can go to patreon.com slash We'll see you all next time.